All right, in this lesson here, what we're going to be doing is providing an overview of the expressions constraint inside of Motion Builder. We're not going to go very deep into this, though we will show you enough to make you guys dangerous. Absolutely. Later on in Constraints 2, then we'll be taking the time to do some more advanced expressions. Basically, what we're doing is the same thing we did for the relations section of this VTM, just giving you an overview. Right, we're just going to get everybody introduced to this expression. So we're starting out with two cubes in the scene. Which we've already dragged in. You guys have seen uh, how to place cubes in your scene by now, I'm A sure. A million times. Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and drag an expressions constraint into my scene, and immediately we get the expressions pane, which has our spreadsheet. That's right, and he's going to go ahead and lock, as you see, his browser over there. Yes. Uh, now, the expressions constraint itself is powered by a spreadsheet. Now, you're going to designate cells of this spreadsheet as senders, uh, others as receivers, and they're going to have actual mathematical functions to place in between the two. Exactly. This will work different from what a lot of you guys out there that are familiar with working with other 3D applications are used to. So but in the end, it's quite interesting. All right, so in the just to start off, I'm going to grab the uh, the left cube. I'm going to drag it into my spreadsheet, and just like in the relations pane, I get a little pop-up asking if I want to put it in as a sender or receiver. In this case, I'm going to put it in as a sender. Again, as we said in the relations lesson, that's going to be our way of getting information from that object in the scene. Exactly, and in this case, instead of just having a single box like you do in the relations uh pain, what you end up with is three cells being filled with the rotation, scaling, and translation information for this cube. And just like you saw in the relations lesson, these are also vectors by default. Now, if I right click on any of these cells after they're filled, I can clear the cell, or I can change the transformation from global to local and back again. Okay. So the second cube over here, I'm going to alt drag into the scene underneath the first set and bring them in as receivers. All right, so now this guy's set up ready to receive information that we send to him. Again, just like the relations lesson. Now, Zach, let's continue doing this similar to the relations lesson by, let's go ahead and create a very simple rotations expression. or Yeah, you could say rotations expression, but a rotations constraint through expressions here. Sure. Uh, so just to kind of get everybody's uh, brain rolling about how these work, you'll notice on our receiver we have an equal sign on the right side of the cell. What that means is our mathematical expression, if you will, needs to follow directly after that. Yeah, for those of you guys that are used to programming, this is just like that, where you'd say, like, a variable x equals, and then you have whatever statement on the right-hand side is going to be assigned into x. It's the same thing here. The really cool thing is that since we already have a sender in here that has our first cube's rotation, we don't need to really type anything in here. There's a couple of ways we could go about doing this. We can go ahead and make a call to the cell in uh, to cell A1 by coming here and typing A1 and pressing enter. That's pretty simple. Now if we rotate our two cubes now move in tandem, we do have a, a basic rotation constraint effect because again breaking this down what we have in A4, which is the receiver for rotation of the second cube, the constrained object, is equal to or receiving information from whatever is in cell A1, which is the rotation data from the sending cube. Exactly. But if we don't want to make a call to that, we could actually just grab the information in this cell that we've called in as a sender and drag it into cell B4, and we get the exact same effect. Gotta love that drag and drop. Okay, so before going on any further, now let's talk a little bit more about this spreadsheet. These cells, basically you have different types of cells. You've got sender cells, as you've already seen, and you've got receivers, as you've already seen, but you also have cells that are expression cells, and you have values cells. All right. And we're about to put these into good use. Also, uh, the cells that you have just storing data, you know, the ones that you're not going to be making uh, an actual... Values ma cells. Uh, exactly. You can uh, set these to several different data types. That's right. And if you right-click on any cell, you'll get a data editor, which will actually show a uh, default, which is for entering in mathematical expressions, uh, booleans, color, color and alpha, number, time, vector. I'll just kind of give a quick example of some of these, and they'll become really clear. Yeah, switch over to vector real quick, just to, and then do the one to the right of it, C1. Do it as a number, so you can see the difference quickly between these. There you go. So you can see how you can go in there and... I guess you could say hardwire in a vector if you wanted to in cell B1. Exactly. 
Or you could go into C1 and put in a, a number. And just like with every other uh, number value within Motion Builder, we can drag on these to change their values. Absolutely. But you will see in just a second, we'll start using a mathematical expression, and we can actually put our numbers in there as well. Exactly. As a matter of fact, Zach, let's go ahead and make things a little bit more interesting. What I want you to do now is let's build, through the expressions here, a special type of constraint where I can have the constrained object, the cube on the right. I want to be able to freely move him around in the X and Z axes. But I want his Y to match the first cube, the okay. center object. All right. I can do that. So what I'm going to do here to pull this off is maybe we should take a second and talk about vectors. Okay. Because vectors actually have three values. Right. We saw that in the relations. There's lesson. an X and a Y and a Z. Now, we can make calls to these three various values by using sub-numbers, if you will. Okay. So uh, let me just go ahead and uh, give a demonstration. So as opposed to, just go ahead, I'm sorry. No, please. I was just going to say, so as opposed to just making a call to say A3, you could say A3, then you could do an open square bracket, and 0, 1, or 2, and 0 would be X, 1 would be Y, and 2 would be Z. Exactly, and I'll, I'll go ahead and demonstrate to make that a little, a little clearer for those who've never worked with vectors before. So I'm going to go ahead and alt-drag my second cube in, again as a sender, and then under my translation... I'm going to go ahead and put in a mathematical, well, not exactly a mathematical expression. We're just going to kind of enter in a vector with some interesting values. Right. So I'm going to start off with an open curly brace. And now the first value, you say you want uh, this cube here on the right to actually f only follow the Y translate of the left That's cube. right. Now I want to be able to freely move it around in X and Z. Okay. And you'll see as he's typing here, this is why he brought that cube in as a cinder as well, so we can go ahead and read his X and Z information that's coming from that cube. This will leave it free for our animator to drag the cube around. Exactly. So here's how he's doing it. He's going to start it out with an opening curly brace, and this is going to indicate that we're going to have three values separated by commas inside, and of course the whole thing is going to be representing a vector, which is what the translation information on the left-hand side, cell A6, is expecting. So right now he's put... B sub 0, when I say sub 0, I'm talking about B3, excuse me, open square bracket, 0, close square bracket, and that's referring to whatever's up in B3 right there, which is the translation for our cinder cube of the cube on the right. We're taking his X information now and assigning it back to himself. Exactly. Remember, a vector has an X, a Y, and a Z value. They're referred to in, program, in most programming languages, including Motion Builder, as sub-0, sub-1, and sub-2. Yeah, it all depends on the application if it's zero-based or one-based. Exactly. This is zero-based. Exactly. So for the Y, we actually need to pull the Y translation from our regular cube, not cube 1, but... Our, uh, our original cube. So we're going to do that by making a call to cell A3, where that cube's translation is stored. And then the open square bracket, because then while we're making a call to that cell, we need to step down into the Y, which would be sub 1. Exactly. So we'll close that sub off. We'll hit a comma. And now we need one more number to complete our vector. So we're going to make a call back to our, our, cube, our constrained cube, if you will. Right. And so that'll be B3... And then the last part of our X, Y, Z part of the vector, which will be sub 2. And then close the curly brace off and hit enter. If there is an error, you will find the error right there. It will also tell you there is an error as well. And then you need to go ahead and check and see what you may have typed in wrong. Exactly. At that point, it's just troubleshooting. So let's go ahead and test this out. I'll start off by moving our gu Oops. We got a little bit of a uh, local rotation here. Let me go ahead. Yeah. And just to <laughs> make things a little clearer, let me zero out all of his rotation. Okay, so I can move our original cube in X, Z, and Y, but when I move them in Y, our constrained cube is going to come with us. Very nice. At the same time, we can take our constrained cube and still move him freely in X and Z. But you cannot move it but up and down cannot in cannot move him up and down in Y. Excellent. Okay, so now we've done two different expressions, making things just a little bit more interesting as we proceed. Now I want to do one final one for this 
a lesson right here as an, again an overview of expressions and that is going to be a similar expression that a lot of people have seen used with characters before for keeping the hips centered between two feet and we're just going to do this with some cubes real quick though absolutely so we're going to want to respect we're going to want the center cubes so we're going to be making one more cube we want it to be centered between the two outer cubes in the z direction the x direction and also let's we'll go ahead and throw rotation in there as well so that when we rotate around y for either of the two outer cubes the inner cube will split the difference between them all right so the first thing i'm going to do is clear out some of my data cells that i'm not going to be using anymore we're no longer going to be using cube one as a receiver so i'll go ahead and clear that out we are going to need a third cube in the scene so i can just control c control V and translate my new cube out now I'll go ahead and start by just bringing my third cube in as my constrained object okay so I'm gonna alt drag him into the scene as a receiver but we're also gonna need to keep some of his current data we're not gonna constrain every single aspect of his uh, his translation right <clears throat> so we're also gonna bring him in as a sender as well So let's go ahead and I'll establish my, <coughs> excuse me, I'll establish my uh, expression okay. for translation. I'm going to start off by moving this up. We'll assume that these would be like uh, markers for our feet, and this would be for our hips. Okay. So we need some sort of offset up here. So we'll start off. We need to put in a vector. So we'll open a curly brace, and then we're going to be calling in the position. So we need to start with the how can I put this the x value of our vector which is going to be a little interesting a little how can I say unique well, let's just go ahead and leave the x and the y open right now so we'll repull them from himself we'll, okay. just, we'll just make z stay centered between the other two boxes we'll start simple and work okay. our way up I was going to go ahead and do x and z right now but we don't have to do that that's right so I'm just going to make a simple call to the first part of his rotation and the idea behind me having Zach just kind of back up and just keep it simple is it's for people that are new to working with expressions, it's always a good idea to build your way up. When you're writing an expression that's going to control multiple things at one time inside the expression formula itself, it's best to just do one piece at a time and verify that it works and then continue building to it. Absolutely. So for the X factor of our, <coughs> of our vector, I have just made a call to C3 sub 0, which is the X of C3. And if you remember, C3 is himself. He's receiving his own information. Exactly. So we'll still be able to move him freely in X. The next one I'm going to put in C3 sub 1. And the final one is where it gets a little bit funny. Because now we've got to take a few things into account. In Z, we always want our constrained object to stay directly in between our two parent objects. Right. Our sources, if you will. So this is where we actually have to go in and put a little math. Okay. So I'm going to open a parentheses, and we're going to say A3, which is the translation cell for cube, and then we'll, we'll say sub 2, which is, of course, its Z number. We're going to add that, with a plus, of course, to B3, which will get us into this cell, also sub 2, which is the the z factor right then we're going to close our parentheses put a division sign <coughs> and divide our result by two and then close off our curly brace so basically what's happening is we're taking the z of the two outer cubes we're adding them together then dividing by two and that's going to find the midpoint between them exactly so now we can take either one of these cubes and as we translate them in z our constrained cube stays directly in between. So you see how it takes one step forward there, now grab the other cube and move it forward, and you'll see that the center stays centered. Exactly. All right, but now at the same time, if we go up and we select the cube up at the top, the constrained object, you'll see that we can still move it up and down in Y and back and forth in X. So now, Zach, go ahead and update the expression now that we've confirmed that this part works to also accommodate X. Absolutely. So X, of course, is the sub-zero area. So instead of making a call to C3 sub 0, we're instead going to make a call very similar to what we had before. And I could just go ahead and copy and paste this, 
But I want everyone to see me actually type it. Because Zach likes making you watch him type. <laughs> exactly. So, I'm going to open up a parentheses again. We'll make a call to A3. For those of you guys out there that remember basic mathematics, the reason we're using the parentheses is for order of operation because we want to make sure that the two cells get properly added before we divide them by two. And multiplication and division has a higher order of precedence over the addition sign right there or operation. So what would happen if we did not use the parentheses is basically in this case B3 sub 0 would be divided by 2 first, and we don't want that to happen. Exactly. So right now I'm making calls to the sub zero number okay as which is x as opposed to sub 2 as i did before i'm going to close my parentheses divide by 2 and press enter and now let's try out x well first of all go ahead and try to move x up there on the one that well never mind okay <laughs> so you can see we can no longer move x now and, and there we go very nice so let's go ahead and throw one more thing in and let's do the rotation as well. Absolutely. And I'm going to have Zach get a drink of water right now so he doesn't die on us. Okay, thanks. Mm. Starting to choke there at the end. <laughs> I saw that. You were turning blue. I know. Okay, so we need to go ahead and make a call over to the rotation. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let's just do rotation Y now. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move up here to the cell right next to our rotation receiver. And, you know, we're just going to put in a vector very similar to what we did before. But in this case, you know, we're only rotating the hips in the y-axis. That's right. Oh, it's so nice to be able to talk again. This <laughs> is great. So uh, we don't really need anything from x, so we can go ahead and just call the rotation data from our cube itself right in with no problem. Just like we did earlier. Exactly. So I'll come in here and just actually make a call to C1, sub-0. And just for, co I'm being a little picky here, Cop capitalization does not matter with these cells, but I'm trying to make everything stay nice looking, just for, uh, for example's sake. So, now we need to set for our y value pretty much the exact same kind of expression we have earlier on our position. So I'm going to go ahead and open up parentheses. We'll make a call to a1 sub 1, which is the number, of course, at y in cell a1. Add that to B1 sub 1, close parentheses, divide by 2, comma, and now for Z, we're just going to make a call again to C1 sub 2. Oh, that's curly brace and not a close parentheses. Okay. And we'll press enter. And all is good. And so now we get zeros over here because there's, as of yet, there's been no rotation on our original right. objects. So now we rotate in X we get nothing. We rotate in Z, we get nothing. But if we rotate in Y, we get a split difference between the cube on the far left and the one that Zach has currently selected, and that's then placed on the cube up at the top, the exactly. constrained object. Fifty percent of that rotation is going to this guy. So now I can come over here and rotate this one as well. And our constrained object stays right in between. You got it. So this, this is, again, just a basic overview of how expressions work inside of Motion Builder. Expression constraints are very powerful, uh, very similar in a sense to the relations expression where you have senders and receivers, except as opposed to doing everything visually, you're doing it, I guess you could say, mathematically. Exactly. I mean, you still have converters where you can convert a number to a vector, or you can go in and, I mean, there's time to seconds. You've got uh, Boolean operations where you've got and equals greater than. You have the if, if you want to, just like you saw before. There's just a bunch of different types of expressions available that you can plug in. And if you refer to your book, I believe it's chapter 40 inside the book, you can uh, find an expressions reference for you that contains all of these different expressions that you can use. Exactly. Unlike the relations pane, there's no set list within the program that shows you all of the uh, various factors you can use. Exactly. And one other thing is, in regards to where Zach was placing those senders at inside the spreadsheet, does it matter where he places them? No. Just be careful not to place them on the other side of an equals of a receiver that's already predefined inside the spreadsheet. Exactly. Everybody who uses spreadsheets has their own organizational method. Exactly. So that's going to wrap this lesson up. Look for us to be going a little bit more involved in expressions and constraints, too. So we'd like to thank you very much. Thank you.